My first memory of ever being interested in social justice was hearing about Anne Frank when I was just a little kid and, and couldn't believe that just because she was Jewish, she was being persecuted. And it seemed just wrong. And <clears throat> so I always had a soft spot for the underdog, anybody who was taken advantage of on the playground or whatever. I mean, I think I was always kind of small myself uh, and maybe could identify with people who were getting pushed around. But, um, yeah, it almost feels innate or something that uh, maybe it maybe it happened when I, before I could even remember. Um, my uh, my mother and my grandmother were always very kind people. I'd hear stories about my grandmother giving food to the uh, people who didn't have any during the depression, and her house was marked. Uh, you know, this is a good place to get some food if you were um, down and out and unemployed and so forth. And I think. That there just was that sense that you you shared, you gave, you worked hard, you didn't let that happen. But I I don't know. But on the other hand, my family was not that political, and it was never like um, you know. It's always not, not just a sense of justice. I don't, I don't know. I think I picked up that much later, or it was you know the natural when you're a certain age, you just always want things to be fair and that stuck. I should say in high school, my answer to the Vietnam War was that we should just bomb them because my upbringing was that um, the United States was always right and whatever we did was good and the President of the United States would never make a bad decision. So um, <clears throat> I obviously changed uh, and I think it was learning more information in college about the Vietnam War, the history of U.S. intervention there, history of U.S. involvement in other parts of the world that was negative. And uh, so I became on my campus, a small school in Ohio, um, active against the Vietnam War. And then when I came to Chicago, uh, I went to my first peace march down Michigan Avenue. And there were people there heckling us and uh, telling us we didn't know what we were talking about because we were young. And yet it was clear that this was the right direction, and uh, I think I was hooked from then on. During the 70s, uh, I was very involved in anti-nuclear work. I helped found an alternative high school. I was uh, very involved with um, getting kids engaged in community service of one sort or another. And I was also involved in doing anti-hunger work, both within the church and outside. And then in the early 80s, I was teaching ESL, uh, and I heard the stories of uh, my students who wouldn't even come out to the class because there were raids by the Immigration Service. Uh, they were just afraid, and here they were really trying to learn English, they were trying to work hard, and they were being uh, really terrorized by these raids. And so I heard about uh, the Chicago Religious Task Force on Central America and that they were working to stop U.S. intervention in Central America, stop the wars there, but also um, concerned about the refugees and the immigrants here uh, in Chicago. So I joined and was part of the steering committee. <clears throat> and then um, probably in early 1982, Jim Corbett came up to Chicago and asked if the Chicago group would be the really national organizers for the sanctuary movement. Uh, they were inundated with refugees in Arizona, and they needed somebody to help find new sanctuary congregations around the country, help educate people about the issues both of sanctuary and of the war in Central America. And after deliberating a small amount of time, we decided to do that. And so we needed to start, and my church, Wellington Avenue United Church of Christ, was known as an activist church, so I proposed to the congregation that we study the issue and decide whether we should become a sanctuary congregation. And, <clears throat> and it was in March when the first sanctuary was declared at First Presbyterian Church in Tucson. It was uh, July when Wellington Avenue declared sanctuary here in Chicago, becoming the first sanctuary church out of, outside of a border state. We welcomed a young man, Juan, into sanctuary. We had struggled for two years to try to get the issue of the Central American War out to the public. 
and here in one moment where there was a real live human being with a human story to tell, it was all over the news. Uh, he left and went uh, on to settle in this country, so he took in a Salvadoran family. And they, they had uh, three kids, two in elementary, one in high school. And we, you know, we took them into the church. They lived in the church for two years. Uh, when they first got here, though, they had to be, uh, the kids needed to get into school and so forth. And I went to the um, local elementary school, and they, the, um, they said, I need to register these two kids. And she said, well, just give us some identification as to their age, and uh, we, we can enroll them. And I said, well, I don't really have any identification. So she made me go see the principal. And I told the story to the principal, and she looked at me in a very stern way and said, uh, are the, is this a family that's in sanctuary at Wellington Church? And there was a moment I was thinking, um, well, if I answer truthfully, they might not get into school. Um, but then I thought, this whole movement, sanctuary movement, this whole movement is about telling the truth. And we ha we're telling the big truth, we have to tell the little truth. And so I said, um, yes. <clears throat> and she said, well, you tell the pastor and the congregation, I'm really proud of them. And you just issue a baptismal certificate and, and we'll admit them to the school. Same thing happened in the high school because it had gotten so much TV coverage. Uh, I went to the guidance counselor and I said, this guy needs to get in. He re doesn't know any English. He doesn't have any papers. And she said, is this the family that was on TV or, and about the sanctuary? And, and being emboldened from my previous experience, I said yes. <laughs> and uh, she was an African-American guidance counselor, and she just said, you tell him if he needs anything, just come and see me. It's the least I can do to help people who are fleeing this kind of violence. Which, <clears throat> which told me that there's a tremendous amount of human, humanitarian energy and willingness out there. You have to find it and tap it and connect it. So sanctuary lasted. I, I went all over the country. I probably gave 500 uh, presentations on the sanctuary movement, and especially in churches uh, that maybe had not been politically involved at all, they were just totally astounded that any of this could be happening and that the United States was involved. Because of the media shutdown, the lack of information in, in general, they, they were just incredulous that this could be happening, especially in the name of the United States. Um, so there were hundreds of sanctuary churches that were, and synagogues and Quaker meetings that declared sanctuary all across the country. And we became kind of the hub of, for information, uh, how to do it very practically, but also the theological, historical reflection on why sanctuary. And, and we felt that it was important for each congregation to go through a thir thorough study and reflection because that was how they could decide how they were going to live their faith. And even in some congregations where they said no to sanctuary, uh, they decided, well, we're going to open a homeless shelter because if we're not helping people from Central America, we have to do something. So it spurred people's um, faith in action, basically. Um, 1990, I began as uh, regional director of the American Friends Service Committee and was involved in uh, all the activities with uh, AFSC at that time and, and then um, more recently with the war. Uh, in Iraq, uh, both protesting the war <clears throat> before it started, organizing interfaith um, services, marches, uh, processions, and uh, then in 2004 starting Eyes Wide Open. Rainer and Maria Rilke wrote letters to a young poet, and in it the po young poet is saying, Do, read my poems, am I, a, am I a poet? Tell me, you know, are they good? And uh, should I be a poet? And uh, Rilke writes back and says, um, well, live the question, uh, and someday you'll live into the answer. And that, that capsulates the, the genesis of Eyes Wide Open as much as anything to me, because we, after May 1st, uh, 2003, with the mission accomplished, we knew there was so much that the public did not know. And one of the things they did not know is how many Iraqis were being killed, and with the um, Pentagon outlawing photos of flag-draped coffins, it seemed clear that we were not going to know the whole death toll, the whole destruction. 
And so we kept living with it. How do we show the American public uh, the human cost of this war? And we just, I think it's living with the question. And when you live with the question, everything that comes in front of you in your life could be a possible answer. And so one day I was um, looking at a national news magazine and there was some combat boots in there. And, I, and, I, and all of a sudden I just said, that's it. Um, this can show in a respectful way the human cost. And if you line all of them up, uh, you will see the death toll in a whole different way. Um, and then it was funny because um, the... Uh, uh, the first time we exhibited, we had 503 pairs of boots in Federal Plaza, and then we had on placards all the names of the, the people who had been killed. And um, the second time we did it, I just said, I thought, well, we have to put the n names on the boots. And everybody around here thought I was nuts. In fact, I had to do the, the first name tags. I did them with uh, um, shelf paper, <laughs> clear shelf paper. I, put, I printed out the names, and I sandwiched them between two pieces of shelf paper and cut them up and stuck holes in them and put them on the boots. And nobody wanted to help me because they thought it was a goofy idea. And yet, and I don't know how that came to me, but it just seemed that we had to individualize it even more by attaching the names to the boots. And I remember in Washington, the first time we went to Washington, uh, May of 2004, and there was a woman that came up, a young woman who had lost her uncle, who was also her godfather, and we looked all over for her boots, and she just sat down by these pair of boots and wept. And it was like, all of a sudden, it hit me. I mean, this is, this is a form, a way for people to show their grief. Um, and, and actually, after that, I, I got thinking so much more that every family that has to bury a loved one, it's a very private ceremony. You have your family, your friends, and, that, and that's it. Uh, and, and the private grief really leads to very personal questions, like why my son or daughter, why my husband or wife. But this is a public uh, memorial that allows all of us to have some sense of public grief and mourning. And the public grief leads to political questions. Why this war? And that then seemed to be what people took from the exhibit. Being able to focus all of these political, um, systemic, big questions down to an individual and what it means, I think has, has meant the difference. You have to show the human face of an issue to people, um, to both engage them, but also help them understand the big picture then. They don't always start with the big picture. They start, every fe good feature story starts with an individual. and. Um, I think, yeah, and Frank, in a lot of ways, was like that in my life, and maybe some of the refugees have been that for other people. During the whole Eyes Wide Open experience, it reminded me so much of Sanctuary, because it was, again, people in grief telling their stories in order for all of us to become more engaged in understanding of the war, the Iraq War now, the Central American War in the 80s, and that these people who have, at great risk to themselves, their own personal self, have shared their stories, have given us a gift, an incredible gift, that we have to hold very precious. Because in, in one sense, it, it's a cathartic experience for them, but in another sense, it takes its toll on them. And so I think it's all, all the more incumbent upon us then that we have the responsibility to, to really protect and cherish that gift and use it wisely in order to advance uh, a more peaceful, just world. I keep doing what I'm doing because I think it's like if I stop doing working for social justice, trying to uh, bring peace, it would be like stopping to bre stopping breathing uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think the um, it, that's what life is to me. You know, it's, it's some people think work is life or um, getting wealthy is life. Uh, it just seems to me that trying to make the world a better place than it was before you got here uh, is the purpose of life. Um, I, um, 
I think I've always had this sense of uh, I, I can't stand to see anybody who is weak get kicked around, and um, I, it just motivates me to, to try to stop it. Uh, I'm even living in Uptown, which is a pretty tough part of Chicago, and um, I go down the street, and uh, I remember one time that this this guy was just getting kicked in the teeth by somebody, and literally, uh, literally kicked in the teeth, and. Uh, uh, I went over and I said, stop it. I, I, just, I just didn't know what to do, but I, all I could do was say, stop it. And, and there were other people watching, and then as soon as I said stop it, they started saying stop it. And he stopped. Um, and it was kind of a lesson to me that sometimes you just have to do something, and other people will join you, but you have to, you have to initiate, you have to do it. And um, there, there just seems so much more that we can accomplish if we, if we kind of let down our sense of hopelessness. I love history also, and I love to read about people who have overcome incredible situations to sometimes win, sometimes maybe not win, but make a statement that then lives on and inspires other people. But uh, our victories are always going to be episodic, partial, temporary maybe, but it seems like each step of the way we have advanced uh, the world a bit and made it more fair, more equitable, uh, more peaceful. We have to f find ways to make people feel able to engage in a communal political process. Uh, there's too much, people are t hanging back too much, they're not becoming involved. And, there has to be both mechanisms and pathways for them to do that. Um, and the more that a group like American Friends Service Committee or any, anybody that can offer uh, ways in which people can come, become involved and engaged in making this a better world. And we cannot do it alone. We have to do it in some kind of community. And the more we, we realize that each of our lives depends on the other in a very positive way, I think the more we will create a more just community in the future.